1956, when Akira Kurosawa's Samurai Opus, The Seven Samurai, was released in the US, one version of the film was given a more Western-flavoured title, The Magnificent Seven. Four years later, director John Sturgis made a Wild West riff on Kurosawa's immortal movie. Using that title and basically the same plot as The Seven Samurai, and in the process made one of the greatest and most famous westerns of all time. This one swaps out samurai swords for six guns, but the premise remains more or less the same. Now, Kurosawa's work is one of those must-see monoliths of cinema, and I'm not going to say that The Magnificent Seven is a better film than that film, but I will say that if you're looking for some fun-filled old west shenanigans and you want to see Yul Brynner, Steve McQueen, Charles Bronson, James Coburn, Robert Vaughan and Eli Wallach acting like badasses, then you won't go far wrong with 1960's The Magnificent Seven. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Stephen at Real Classic Film Reviews. Tell me your favourite westerns in the comments below and click the subscribe button and that little notification bell to stay up to date with more classic film reviews. The Magnificent Seven is the story of a group of gunmen who are hired by villagers to fight off a, a group of bandits led by Calavera, played by Eli Wallach. These no-gooders have managed to take almost everything from a small farming village, leaving them just enough food to survive on so they can prepare the next batch of crops for the bandits to come and pinch. You may even recognise this premise as it was actually pinched again for the plot of Pixar's early effort, A Bug's Life. Anyway, these downtrodden farmers, finally deciding enough is enough, gather together and want to fight back against the bandits. And they travel to the border to buy some guns. And instead, they come across a couple of gunfights led by Chris, played by Yul Brynner, and Vin, Steve McQueen. Everything we own, everything of value in the village. I've been offered a lot for my work. Never everything. So before you know it, Brynner and McQueen, having accepted the job, recruit a few more members to their cause. They bring in two veteran gunslingers in Harry and Lee, played by Brad Dexter and Robert Vaughan, an Irish Mexican named Bernardo O'Reilly, played by Charles Bronson, and a switchblade wielding cowpuncher named Britt, played by James Coburn. Joining them is a young, inexperienced gunfighter named Chico, played by Horst Buchholz. Basically, in the film, so the girls have something to look at, and because Horst was a big star in South America. I mean, the cast is obviously fantastic, and those early scenes in the film where Brynner is gathering his team together is great. The film spends genuine time developing the camaraderie between all these guys, especially between Brynner and McQueen. McQueen famously upset Brynner during production by trying to get the camera's attention constantly, endlessly fidgeting with his hat and his gun. It's funny once you're aware of it, and you can imagine Brynner not being too happy about it, as he was the one who had insisted on McQueen being cast. You can definitely tell that McQueen was on his way to legendary status here. At this point, he was famous for his role in TV's Wanted, Dead or Alive and for his lead role in the 50s B-movie, The Blob. It's definitely here, though, that superstardom comes calling. Yul Brynner as Chris, sporting an entirely black ensemble and one that he'd recycle in 1973's Westworld, is great as the leader of the gang. The pair of them are introduced in one of my favourite scenes in the film as they escort a coffin up a hill towards a graveyard and a gang of unfriendly locals. Not only is it a tense scene, but I love the backdrop of the mountains Awesomely photographed by cinematographer Charles Lang Jr. Bronson and Coburn are equally memorable and are both given their own moments to shine. I love Coburn's cool as a cucumber knife throwing standoff intro and Bronson's wood-chopping gunslinger with a heart gets a, a touching friendship with the town's youngsters. We're ashamed to live here. Our fathers are cowards. Don't you ever say that again about your fathers, because they are not cowards. And not forgetting Robert Vaughan. He's the member of the Seven that actually gets some emotional scenes in the film, and he's haunted by his past deeds, and... Deeds that are so bad that he actually gets a great scene where he freaks out in his sleep. It's a classic. It's all right. You're all right. You had a dream. Just a bad dream. Eli Wallach, who's always my favourite bit of every Western that I see him in, is brilliantly slimy as head bandit Calavera, constantly shaking down towns to feed and clothe his gang. I love his incredulous reaction to the Seven, risking their lives to protect a, a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. For a place like this, why? A man like you, why? 
Magnificent Seven has a fantastic and now classic music score by Elmer Bernstein. Not only is it one of the greatest Western scores of all time, Bernstein's music is one of the most instantly recognisable themes in cinema history. Like Sergio Leone's Dollars Trilogy, the music is in a, a class all by itself and could almost be more famous than the film itself. At just over two hours, it's not the shortest film, but, but it does hit a little bit of a lull in the middle section when the seven start teaching the farmers how to fend for themselves. By this point, you're kind of itching for the bullets to start flying. However, once Eli Wallet comes back into town to throw the gauntlet down, it gets real and it gets really fast with the uh, awesome machete bullets and horses finale. <laughs> Magnificent Seven is a, an interesting and important film for the Western genre because it's very much a stepping stone from the kind of family friendly Hollywoody Westerns of the 50s to the gritty blood soaked Westerns of the mid to late 60s. Italian directors like Sergio Leone and Sergio Carbucci would bring their own spin on America's beloved genre and in the process they'd ruin it for traditionalists like John Wayne and John Ford by dialing up the cruelty and violence. Along with Magnificent Seven's success came three sequels of diminishing quality. We had Return of the Seven in 1966, we had Guns of the Magnificent Seven in 1969, the film that recast Britta, with Chris now being played by George Kennedy, and The Magnificent Seven Ride, which I actually haven't seen, which replaced Yul Brynner with Western legend Lee Van Cleef. I think recently there was a US TV show, which I also haven't seen, but I have seen the 2016 remake starring Denzel Washington and Chris Pratt, which I actually didn't mind, but will admit was totally unnecessary. You won't find a greatest westerns ever made list that doesn't feature this 1960s star-studded original. Perfectly walking the line between family-friendly, men-on-a-mission, Sunday afternoon hijinks and a more mature, gritty, old west style that was to come. It's essential viewing for fans of westerns and for fans of good old Hollywood movie stardom. Go check it out. How many you got? 